So today we are joined by Nancy Lowenstein from Auburn University. Dr. Lowenstein is an extension specialist in the School of Forestry and Wildlife Sciences. And today she will discuss the biology, identification, ecology, and management of privet. This webinar is designed to help woodland donors, foresters, tree care professionals, researchers, natural resource managers, and concerned citizens learn about the different kinds of privet and how we can better manage these invasive species to help improve the health of our forests. With that, I will turn it over to Dr. Lowenstein. OK, thank you for the invitation. And um, even though I am from Auburn, um, thanks everyone for joining us today. Um, as Dave said, I'm going to be talking about um, Privet identifications to start with, then talk a little bit about the biology and impacts, and finishing up with some management options. So most of us have become almost a, um, blind to privet. It, there's so much of it out there. Um, don't even notice it's there. It blends into the background. You do become aware of it if you are taking care of it, if you have privet that you need to control. And then it becomes much more obvious in the spring, of course, when it's blooming. And you will notice it, especially if you are one that suffers from allergies with privet. And I probably don't need to um, convince most of you how much privet there is out there. But here's the um, distribution map from EdMaps showing how widespread and how filled in the map is with um, privet throughout the southeast, up into the northeast, even on the west coast. Also, FIA data shows us that just in Alabama, for instance, we have over a million acres of forest land is in, in, um, impacted, by in, impacted by privet. And of course, it occurs in other areas besides just woodlands. Moving on here now. So when we think of privet, probably the first species that comes to mind is Chinese privet. That's the most ubiquitous. But there are seven species of ligustrum reported as escaped in the southeast and, um, and recorded on EDMAPs. And just in alphabetical order here, we've got amber privet, border privet, California, Chinese, European or common, and then glossy and Japanese. Oftentimes, the, the first five here are often lumped together. And then we have the, the glossy and Japanese larger leaved privets as are um, separate. Oops. All right, sorry here. So general um, identification of characteristics of ligustrums in general, they tend, they're multi-stem shrub to small, small trees. They all have opposite. Um, evergreen to semi-evergreen leaves, generally oval in shape, some variety of oval, with an entire margin. They're very strongly scented, white flowers and panicles. They're highly allergenic. The fruit is small with one to four seeds. They're light green when they're um, immature, turning dark purplish or bluish black. The bark is typically very smooth, light grayish brown with raised lenticels. Of course, as I mentioned, Chinese privet, Ligustrum sinensi, is the one we're most familiar with. You can see the distribution throughout the southeast. You will notice that there are several counties that are still vacant, such as Clark County down here in southeast Alabama or southwest Alabama. I would say if there's anyone on the um, webinar in these areas where there are holes and you know there might be privet there, please go to EdMaps or if you have one of the handy apps, um, mark those distributions so we can, well, not that we really want to fill in the map, but it'd be nice to document that they're there. So let me just go over the um, idea of Chinese privet. I'm going to go into some detail with Chinese privet just because it's a benchmark to contrast the other ones. So as I mentioned, evergreen, semi-evergreen leaves. They're anywhere from one to two inches long, about half an inch to an inch wide. Elliptical to elliptical oblong in shape, dull shiny green above, somewhat paler below, and then there's pubescence on the mid vein, pubescence on the very short petiole, and pubescence on the stem, especially when it's young. The flowers are from two to four inches long, and the panicles are two to four inches long. And with Chinese privet, these panicles can occur terminally or in the axles along the stem. Um, one thing you'll notice down here that the stamens of the flowers emerge beyond the corolla tube. 
And here's just a gratuitous picture of a Chinese privet infestation. Whole growth stand here near Auburn, or in Auburn. European or common privet, on the other hand, occurs mostly in the Northeast, Mid-Atlantic, and Midwest. Looks very similar to Chinese privet, leaves similar size, maybe a bit more pointed at the tips. And if you were to turn the leaves over, you would see that the mid-vein is glabrous on the underside. The flowers, um, unlike Chinese privet, the um, stamens do not extend beyond the corolla tube. Then we have Japanese privet, good bit of it, escaping throughout the southeast, fairly well documented. These leaves are evergreen, larger than Chinese privet, reaching four inches long. Um, did I skip the slide? I think I did. I did. I skipped the slide. Sorry, let me back up. So glossy privet, similar to um, Japanese privet, and it's also called waxy leaf privet. These leaves are three to six inches long, evergreen, very glossy dark green above. These are ovate, ovate lanceolate, so they can have a fairly distinct point on, or tip on them. One thing to look for with this species, you'll see here that the margins and the mid veins are translucent when you hold them up to the light. So one way to remember that, so they glow and you have glossy privets, so that GLO could be a way to remember that. Another feature with this species is that if you bend the leaves, they do not snap when they're bent. These flowers are also white and panicles much larger, five to eight inches long, and the stamens are about even with the corolla tube. And glossy privet can get to be a fairly large, well, up to 50 feet tall, and typically not as multi-stemmed as Chinese privet. And here we are with gloss or Japanese privet. Leaves also evergreen, maybe a bit smaller than glossy privet. They are darker green and more leathery. And on this one, the midrib is not, doesn't, it's not translucent, even might be a little bit reddish, and it might be curled under a little bit. The veins are raised on the underside, and with this one, if you bend the leaf in half, it will snap, just break right in half. So in this one, you can remember, because snap rhymes with Japanese privet. And with this, the flowers are in terminal panicles, fairly large, two to six inches long. And you will see that the stamens clearly extend beyond the corolla tubes, as just like little periscopes. Then we have border privet. Not we have a few sightings or on reports in North Carolina and Tennessee, and for some reason it's very, very well documented in Indiana. This looks a little more similar to Chinese privet, leaves perhaps a little bit more oblong. Like Chinese privet, you might get a little bit of pubescence below or on the midrib. And they might turn kind of reddish purplish in the fall, and then they're deciduous. These flowers are smaller and, um, long and, so, and somewhat drooping axillary panicles. And the um, stamens do not go beyond the corolla tube. Then we have California privet. Once again, looks a little bit like Chinese, um, similar sized leaves. They're darker green, but kind of yellowish green below. This is typically deciduous further north, but um, it might be somewhat or evergreen further south. These flowers are in um, crowded terminal panicles, anywhere from two to four inches long. And with this, the fruit is shiny black when it's ripe. Amber privet, not very many reports of this. And in fact, I had a hard time finding a good picture of it. Um, looks a good bit like the border privet. A bit of information I found was that it's often used as a hedge, but that's not very helpful because many of the privets are. I also wanted to mention this golden privet. I haven't heard any um, reports of it escaping. It's supposed to be sterile, but I'm seeing it more in the trade. There's two different types. There's golden privet shown in the picture here, and this is actually a cultivar of Chinese privet. And then there's also another golden privet, this um, the Ligustrin vicari. It's a cross between California and European privets. As I mentioned, both are purported to be sterile. And so for more information on the identification of Ligustrins, you can look at Michael Durr's Manual of Woody 
landscape plans has a lot of information. And then also Maddox et al. had a paper several years ago on the identification and control of invasive primates. OK, then moving on to privet biology. Or why privet is such a successful invader. So privet invades a wide range of habitats for its it does best in moist, well-drained situations, especially disturbed open areas. Um, but it also occurs very readily in bottomland forests, especially along streams. You see it in forest edges, forest interiors, um, fence rows, right-of-ways. It can tolerate short-term flooding and tolerate mild drought, but it is not particularly um, drought tolerant. And you typically don't find it or you don't find it commonly on very dry sites. Another adaptation that gives privet an edge is that it's shade tolerant. So here we see it in, in forest understory doing well. Here you see let's privet regeneration in the forest understory and also privet sprouts. There's some discussion about you know, whether or not you need to get some canopy opening for that privet regeneration to make it up into the um, overstory, but it's definitely there as advanced regeneration. Another advantage that it has is that being evergreen to semi-evergreen, it gives it a longer growing season than many of its competitors. So in the photograph here, when it's got frost on it, it's not photosynthesizing, but it can just brush that off, and once it gets warm again, it can go back to photosynthesizing. Another adaptation that makes privet so invasive is that it produces abundant seed, especially the plants that are in the sun. The seed is spread by birds, other animals, and water. The seeds will germinate without stratification. And also, going through the gut of birds and other animals actually helps with the germination process. Luckily, the seeds are only viable for about a year, so we don't get a huge seed bank building up. If that was the case, we would be in more trouble than we are with privet. And down here in the bottom right, these are just brand new germinants of privet. Of course, privet also spreads through aggressive sprouting. Remember, you know that if you cut privet here, you get cut one, you get 10. Also, prolific root sprouts. It's very shallow rooted. The roots above this ground or even shallow roots that get damaged will sprout very readily. Don't see stem sprouting very um, often, but you can occasionally see layering when a stem goes down to the ground. It will sprout and could start a new plant. Here's just a, a photo showing of how dense an infestation you can get as um, old privet continues to sprout. Here you can see the numerous sprouts coming from the base of an older plant. It's a very dense infestations. So some impacts of privet. Plant biodiversity, of course, typically very low in the very dense shade of privet. Not much growing here. Of course, you do see situations like shown in this photograph where occasionally you do see other non-natives thriving in the shade of a privet infestation. Got English ivy here, wisteria, liriope. There was Nandina, many others. Another situation we find is that when we get privet in the mid-story, it reduces natural regeneration of, of, of the overstory stand. It's especially a problem in riparian forests and can lead to stand conversion. You have this kind of situation if you go in and try to manage this for, or if you're cutting this stand, you need to take care of the privet beforehand or you're just going to end up with the pure privet stand. And of course, and naturally, it will convert to privet over time. Okay. In addition to impacting plant diversity, privet impacts insect diversity. And of course, yes, honeybees like privet. But more and more st studies, and this I just put a small example here, studies are showing that removing privet helps native bee diversity and um, beetle diversity and um, even native earthworm diversity. Privet also impacts nutrient cycling. Studies have shown that it enhances litter decomposition rates, increases nitrogen mineralization. 
higher soil pH has been found under privet. And it's estimated that in the long run, especially if you have situations with stand conversion and loss of the overstory, that you may see reduced net primary productivity and carbon allocation. A little word about privet and herbivores. Yes, deer will browse privet, um, especially during the winter. It can make up a large portion of their food, what's found in their gut. Um, on the plus side, though, for privet control, as you can see in these pictures, um, it will keep the privet from um, producing flowers and seeds. And just I little, had a picture of that fawn there, because when I was out looking for photos of browse privet, I almost fell over that little guy. A little, little plus for making this webinar. Um, beaver also eat and use privet. This particular photo here, you can see I had I was actually doing some research here, some of my research equipment, and um, the research came to a close because the beaver ate all of my um, research plants. But you can see, so they they eat it and will use it in their dams. Okay. Moving on now to privet control. There's numerous con options for con um, controlling privet, including pulling, mechanical, various herbicide approaches, and even um, fire in some situations. So the method of control will depend on several things. One, how dense the privet infestation is, how tall the plants are, where the infestation is, are you in an urban area, is it riparian, you need to deal with water, pasture, are you under a hardwood stand or pine stand, are there plants that you want to protect? Then what are, are, what are your management objectives? Is it for restoration, forest management, and are you just trying to get it out of your backyard? Also, resources are very important. How much time, money, and labor do you have available to you? And keep in mind, there are, unfortunately, no silver bullets for control. So first off, pulling is an option for seedlings or saplings, of course, a very small infestation. For instance, hand pulling, got a couple of acres of woods behind my house every year. I do a spring roundup. I'm just going around pulling privet, mahonia, eleagnus, and others. Um, mostly, it just makes me feel good. Then for larger saplings, up to maybe an inch or two, you can use a weed wrench. Of course, if anyone has actually used one of those, after about five or ten minutes, you're ready to hand that off to someone else. They're pretty heavy. One thing to keep in mind, though, if you are using them, it does cause some soil disturbance, which can essentially you're providing an area where the seeds can easily get established, and erosion might be a concern. Moving on to mechanical options, brush mulchers are great if you have a very large infestation, you have some monetary resources available to you. These are great from the inspector. You have instant gratification. You had a huge mess of privet, and an hour later, it's gone. But the stumps will be hidden and or shattered underneath all of the chips, so it does not lend itself to immediate treating of the stumps. So what you'll need to do is follow this up with the foliar spray of the sprouts. And ideally, wait till about three or four feet of growth. You need to get enough green leaves above ground so that you get enough herbicide, when you spray it, enough herbicide down to kill all the roots. So you have to have the right root shoot ratio there. Another concern is um, the danger of spreading seeds. If you do this in the fall when the plants are covered with seed, you're just going to scatter those all about. And you will have just made a nice area for um, the seeds to get established. Another concern, if you get soil dis um, disturbance, there might be a concern with erosion. So you need to keep an eye out for that. Use it on appropriate sites. Also mechanical, there's other, any you know bush hogging, mowing, options there. This is probably better for smaller privet plants, but once again, they will re-sprout. Re re Some indication that frequent mowing might, and I'm highlighting might, eventually deplete the underground reserves, but 
more than likely you're just going to create a mess if you just keep mowing it and don't follow up with foliar treatment of um, the regrowth. Okay, and then goats w would essentially be a biomechanical control. They're, you know, chewing the plant down to the ground. It will re-sprout again. You're likely going to need to follow up with foliar spray or repeated browsing. Um, we'll say that Red Mountain Park in Birmingham has been using goats fairly effectively, and they've cleared over 200 acres of privet and other invasive, undesirable um, plants. However, we don't we don't have the research yet to know exactly what the ideal um, optimal grazing strategies are yet, though. But it is an option in some areas, especially in public areas where you know the public would much rather see a cute goat out there than someone with a chainsaw or the brush mulcher going through, or people with you know herbicides and what have you. Okay, so herbicide treatment options: foliar, cut stump, bas cut stump, basil bark, and hack and squirt. Disclaimer. Always read and follow the herbicide label, paying attention to the site and rate restrictions and safety recommendations for applicators. So everyone knows the label is the law. So I'm giving some broad outline here. Of course, whatever um, control options you go with need to be site specific. OK, one thing to take in mind, keep in mind when you're trying to decide what application method to use is the plant density and height. So if we come down here in where we have lower plant density and smaller size plants, that will lend itself to backpack directed foliar. Start once in still with the low density but larger plants, that lends itself to individual plant treatments using basil bark or cut stump. When you get really high density from either small or large plant, that lends uh, broadcast treatments, either handgun or boom or even aerial um, would be a more appropriate choice there. OK, so a little bit on foliar spray. So here on the left, the spot treatment or um, directed spray. A single nozzle backpack sprayer is often um, useful in many situations. One thing to keep in mind is you need to get good coverage of the entire plant. If you're on an edge, as you see here, just spraying the sides of the plant won't cut it. So mentioned, so if you have a situation where you have larger, dense plants, or you know, broadcast spray, or even aerial would be an option. But when you're using that approach, you might have more collateral damage of other plants because you can't have the directed spray avoiding any plants you might want to keep. Okay, for um, foliar backpack treatments, you just need to spray to wet, and this is not a privet here; it's English ivy. But you can see. It's just scattered herbicide on there. It's not sopping wet. And once again, you do need to um, get good coverage, though, over the entire plant. You don't need to spray the herbicide onto the point where it's dripping off the leaves. You're just wasting herbicide at that point. OK, so with um, foliar treatment, glyphosate is usually the herbicide, the go-to herbicide. One thing is to avoid the ready-to-use product or formulations. Those typically don't have a high enough concentration of glyphosate. So you want to use a product with at least 41% active ingredient. Use a 3 to 5% volume to volume solution. That's 4 to about 6.5 fluid ounces per gallon of solution. Um, many glyphosate products already have surfactant built in. But if not, you need to include a uh, a non-ionic surfactant at about half percent volume to volume. And keep in mind, if you are spraying near water, that you need to use a aquatic labeled product, such as Rodeo. There's others. And if you add a surfactant, it has to be an aquatic, aquatic approved surfactant. Optimal timing for spraying with glyphosate is late fall into early winter. Um, when you do spray in the winter, you need to make sure that the temperatures are mild enough plant essentially needs to be photosynthesizing. Um, and a good reason for using the um, fall winter treatment is that many desirable plants 
if they're deciduous, they will have dropped their leaves so they won't be damaged by the glyphosate. Okay, triclopyr amine, which is found in Garlon 3A and Element 3A, is another option for herbicide um, foliar treatment. In this case, you'd use a 2% volume to volume solution. Also, there are some ready to use products, such as many of the brush killers that are a mixture of um, triclopyr amine and glyphosate, and those can sometimes be used effectively you know, in a backyard situation. So there are some other herbicides that are available there are, that are effective on privet. This would be more for a um, forest management situation. So the triclopyr ester, Garland 4, and the triclopyr ester plus 2,4-D, amazepyr, and of course an arsenal, and then also metsulfuron, which is ex, um, escort. Um, keep in mind, though, that the amazepyr and metsulfuron are soil active, so you can get more collateral damage. You don't want to be using those when you have any hardwoods nearby that you want to save or that you don't want to kill. Um, and keep in mind, too, of course, you might think that a plant, like a tree, is not that close to where you're working, but roots go a long way, and they might pick up the herbicide, and that would not be a problem, or that would be a problem not be good. Um, so here I've got a picture of the management guide for invasive plants in southern forests. That goes into more detail about some of these um, management approaches in a, a forest management situation. A few cautions with foliar spray. Be careful of drift and be careful of volatil volatility if using triclopyr ester. Also, once again, if spraying near streams, ponds, swampy areas, anywhere wet, use an herbicide labeled for use in an aquatic environment. And of course, always read and follow the herbicide label. If you're in a situation where you want to do individual plant treatments, of course, there's the cut stump approach. You need to cut it close to the ground. Of course, you can't just cut it and walk away because it will sprout. So you need to treat it within minutes with an herbicide. With a large um, stem, you can get away with just doing the outside of the stem. Smaller stems, you want to do the entire surface. So glyphosate and triclopyr amine are the go-to um, herbicides here. So 25% solution of glyphosate using the 41% active ingredient works well. Same with triclopyr amine, a 25% solution. And adding a spray indicator, it's got the blue spray indicator here. It's very helpful to keep track of where you're being. You're leaning over, lopping off stems. Anyone's done this, you know you get dizzy and disoriented pretty quickly and lose track of where you've been. So that helps you keep track. If you're in a situation where you're doing cut stump but you can't treat immediately, you can do this delayed cut stump approach where you use an oil-based mixture of herbicide, essentially the same thing you'd use for basal bark, and you're spraying the entire top and down with the, any exposed um, stem there, and that you're spraying to the point of runoff. So the 20% solution of triclopyr ester in an oil uh, carrier can be used in this situation. And in this picture, you can see someone used a red dye indicator. And I just have to say, every time I see this photo, it reminds me of the Black Knight from Spamalot. Just but a scratch. So a drawback of cut stone treatments is that they are very labor intensive, and you have to figure out what to do with cut material. You can't, you know, if you just drop it where you are, it makes it, you know, difficult to spray the stumps. So, you got to haul it. And as you can see here, we, in this particular situation, we had a, um, a, a grinder out there to get rid of the material. Okay, then other individual plant treatment would be basal bark. In this case, you have to treat the entire stem all the way around. 12 to 15 inches above the ground, and you have to get, you know, even little tiny sprouts to the side. You need to get all of them. Those will just grow if you don't. 
So this kind of situation here is not appropriate for basal bark. You would be there forever. So as I mentioned with basal bark treatments, treat the lower 12 to, 12 to 15 inches of every stem. Use an oil carrier, not water. So bark oil, mineral oil, crop oil. You can even use diesel, but that will give you quite a headache. It's not as environmentally friendly either. And then you use an oil soluble herbicide formulation such as the Trichopyr ester. Hack and squirt can be used on larger stems and situations where you don't have a bunch of sprouts coming up. And no, this is not privet in this picture, but it's just showing hack and squirt. Um, anyways, with hack and squirt, the number of hacks and spacing will be on the herbicide label. You can use a variety of herbicides, glyphosate, trichopyramine, and masperin, and even some of the newer chemistries might be useful. So timing for cut stump, basal bark, and hack and squirt treatments. Optimal is often late summer through early fall. Actually get good control. It's more comfortable. And as I mentioned before, um, you can avoid collateral, well, that was with um, foliar, but avoiding collateral damage to other plants. One thing to keep in mind is to avoid high temperatures when using trichlorophyll ester, since as I mentioned earlier, it can volatilize. You do want to avoid late winter and early spring when the sap flow is upward. And keep in mind, too, that some basal bark oil carriers, you know, if it gets really cold, they're going to become thick and clog up. And not they'll be hard to apply when it's very cold. OK, quick word about fire and privet control. So in some situations, fire might be used to top kill the privet, but it will re-sprout. So you could use this as a pretreatment option for privet or for herbicide if you can get the privet to burn. Um, repeated annual burning might control small privet and or keep it from getting established. Um, but the burning is not likely to be effective on moist riparian sites and could damage the overstory trees if you can get it to, to burn. But it might be hard to get a fire to carry in the moist area. And as I mentioned, we get increased decomposition rates, so you don't have a lot on the um, forest floor in the riparian situations. So we need more research on fire and privet control. And for more information, you can go to the Forest Service Fire um, Effects Information System website is listed there. And one thing to keep in mind always when working with um, any invasive plant control is to keep safety in mind. Use the appropriate um, personal protective equipment. So then in summary, there are a lot of options for privet control, but the sad truth is no single treatment will eradicate privet, because you will get a flush of seedlings following the treatment. You can expect some sprouting from stumps and lateral roots, even you know with individual plant treatment. You're not going to get them all. And you will get reinvasion from nearby sites. Control your credit, but if your neighbor hasn't, birds are going to keep bringing it back, or floodwaters or other mechanisms. So you always need to monitor and follow up with spot treatments um, to get new, the new um, plants and sprouts. And also, in some situations, it might be a good idea to try to get native plants established, help you know, slow down reinvasion of privet and help stabilize the site and prevent erosion. As Dave mentioned, we have this control options for Chinese privet, which you can get either at aces.edu or on the link that Dave mentioned on the web page or the webinar web page. We also have a bulletin on cut stump herbicide treatments and one on basal bark treatments. And with that, I flew through this and um, done, and plenty of time for questions. 
Excellent. Thanks, Nancy. Uh, I neglected to mention at the onset, but anyone who has questions, please type them into that chat window on the side. We've had a couple come in um, that I've recorded, and I will go ahead and moderate them. Here's another good one that just came in here. So as you bring these in, I am the copying and pasting them. So let's have a little chat with some of these questions about uh, the privet control stuff. So uh, Nancy. Yes. One question says, I was talking with a contractor yesterday, and he recommended foliar spring privet in the dead of winter, not late fall. And I'm going to assume it depends on where you are for this type of thing, but I thought maybe you could chime in on that. OK, so actually dead of winter mm -hmm. should work as long as, as the you know, it's not too cold. So if the privet is still actively, not necessarily growing, but if it's photosynthesizing and it's not shriveled up, you know, frozen, if it's not in the middle of a drought, that can work. OK. I was always told that it kind of depends where you are, and there will be a time during the winter or fall when privet is pretty much the only green thing there. And that is when you should hit it. Right, so that might be the den of winter. So, yeah. and like I said, so that you reason to do that is that many of the plants that you want to keep will not have their leaves on it, so they won't be impacted by your foliar spray. Gotcha. But you don't want to wait too late in the winter to where you're already getting the spring upward flow of sap. Although that's not as important with foliar spray as with the others, but. Right. And should you treat that stuff when it's already flowering, or is that too late? Huh. Well, yeah, so it doesn't work as well in the summer. So research so that if you're going to go during the summer months and spring, you're going to need a higher concentration. Gotcha. Now let me just say, I mean, another disclaimer, I am not an herbicide expert. So. Noted. So get with your local <laughs> herbicide professional, is what yes. you're saying. <laughs> well, are you a goat expert? Because we have some goat questions. I do not have a, I am not a goat expert. Well, you, you are today. So okay. I do, um, I goats can only eat what they can reach, we're assuming. So that's pretty much only going to take care of the seedlings or smallish plants, or like the goat farm next to our house, everything to about four feet high. Right. So, like I said from the very beginning, what approach you use is going to depend on the density of the stand, how big it is, all of those. So, right. Do you have any idea about the cost or logistics of getting those goats there? No, I do not. Of course, I mean, one of the logistics, of course, is that you have to keep the goats penned up so they're not yeah. going everywhere. You have to make sure they're not getting killed by predators. Um, but I would say if you are interested in using goats, I would contact Red Mountain Park in Birmingham and to see what their experience has been with it. Yeah, and I'll chime in. There's those uh, goat grazing organizations are starting to pop up in a lot of places. We have a couple mm -hmm. here in Athens. I've seen them around town with their little trailer and stuff. So, right. you know. Uh, and so this last comment that came in, uh, goats would eat natives too. To my knowledge, yes, they will pretty much. Right, so that is another you know, concern with using goats is that just like glyphosate, you know, they're going to get whatever yeah. they can get a hold of. So it's not selective. Yeah, so what I had heard and learned about goats is they're one of those things that uh, if it's so thick you don't even know what to do, bring goats in to sort right. of do a start over. Right. Right, OK. Um, they're flying in. This is good. This is good. Uh, let's see. What can you tell us about the prospects for biological control? Now, this says, I know Dr. James Hanula had been screening insect natural enemies. Also, how common is the ligustrum weevil that attacks the fruits? Right, so um, there is research ongoing, as far as I know, with um, biological control. I didn't include it because there are currently no biological controls available. Um, and I do not know how common that weevil is. I was yeah, reading somewhere that I guess it might be more prevalent in the Japanese and possibly the glossy privet. I don't know how much it occurs in the Chinese. Okay. Okay. And another um, concern is that, I mean, it is still used a lot as an ornamental. So I don't know what kind of pushback you might get from 
the green industry if we were to release. Right. I'm right. not arguing that we don't do it. I'm just saying there could be pushback there. Yeah, I think you're probably you're probably right. Um, how do you restore areas with native plants uh, once you have, let's say you do successfully remove a privet, do you just restore areas naturally or is there a strategy to go about when you're trying to replace privet with something native? Hmm. Well, there's, I don't think there's any easy answer or one, one broad answer to that. I think it's going to be very um, site specific. Also going to depend on whether you have deer in the area to whether you, what you can plant. Um, yeah, I don't know on that one. So there are situations okay. where you can definitely go in and seed or plant natives on a smaller scale. Yep. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. another thing to keep in mind is uh, the timing. You know, if you are still expecting a lot of privet sprouts to come back, you don't want to waste a lot of time and money establishing native plants when you're still going to have to go back in and control the privet. Right, right, right. And you're going to have to be very directed spray. Yep. Uh, is there a possibility of translocation of herbicide from interspecies, interspecies root grafting? Um, I would think yes, especially if you're using something like Emancipure. Okay. But once again, like I said, I'm not an herbicide expert, but that could possibly... Right, so, so folks that are asking those uh, specific herbicide questions, if you don't know who your state herbicide person is, uh, shoot me an email and I will get you in touch with them so I can probably figure that out. Uh, also, someone asked if they could get a copy of the PDF or the slides back up. Those are both available in PDF form on that main forestrywebinars.net page. Uh, you just click on it and the PDF should download for you. Um, how do you address, this is for you, Nancy, how do you address comments about privet being good because bees and birds use it? Um, well, Birds, many of the birds that use it are just passing through, and um, while there may be a few species that use it, overall it's reducing diversity so much that I think the, the wildlife habitat in general is not favorable for the broad majority of species. Also, it's probably while the birds like the, the berries and the main nest in privet, it's probably, as Dr. Dr. Tallamy's work shows it's probably not supporting many other insects that serve as um, food for baby birds. Right. I was also told that privet berries are like McDonald's for birds <laughs> in that they love it, they will eat tons of it, but it is very low nutritional value. So it's like junk food. Right. Um, that's, well, that's what it was told to me. So That's probably why they like it. Yeah, right. But on the other hand, for people, it can it's mildly toxic. Okay. So to anyone that says, what about the privet, it's good for birds, just tell them it's like junk food and you don't want to do that to the birds <laughs> for all sorts of stuff. And as um, far as bees, once again, you know, more honeybees may like it briefly, but overall it's reducing habitat for native bees, pollinators, and other insects. Right, right, and there's been a lot of research on um, the impact of privet removal on insect communities. Jim Hanula did a lot of that stuff, and it really right. showed that, yes, there are some bees that like it, but if you get rid of that privet, you've got a much, much, much more um, right. healthy and diverse insect and right. pollinator community in general. Uh, so it's really not even, a, it's not even close, in all honesty. Exactly. So you have just a one-term yep. brief. So a question came in, is there actually research on the nutritional negative impacts on birds, the junk food thing? <laughs> uh, yes, <clears throat> but I don't know what it is off the top of my head. Yeah. But I asked that same question when I heard it from, and I remember who said it. I said, is this like legitimate or not? And they said yes, and they gave me a citation, and I cannot think, I, I don't remember where I put that right now. So yeah. it is there. Um, I don't recall seeing that. Well, it's there, and Hans, Hans Landel asked this. If you really want me to follow up, Hans, you send me an email, and I will get on it and try to figure it out for you. 
Uh, Nancy, back to you. With privet and other invasive plants in our southern forests, isn't it about control and management instead of eradication? Meaning, is eradication clearly not possible at this point in time? Correct. Eradication of privet is not possible at this time, but you could probably eradicate privet at least for a short term on a particular site. But so essentially, right, control and management is what we're facing now. And privet serves as a poster child to, you know, we don't want to get in the situation with all of the invasive plants that are out there. Right, right, right. Um, you know, that sort of brings up a, a point that I've had a lot of chats with about is we're not going to get rid of privet, but it needs to be, you know, and we're in that control and management standpoint. For anyone that helps manage forests and do management plans now, it's very important to consider privet and other native plants. Uh, the example was we were in a stand uh, last year and it was covered in privet, but the stand was going to be harvested that fall. Mm -hmm. um, without a plan on how to how to manage that privet, you take out those overstory trees, you're not going to get anything planted back in there. It's just going to be a privet field. Right. So for, for anyone that works with people that have land that's, you know, going through the a conversion process from older trees to younger trees, you got to get that privet down or else it's going to completely take over. And you got to plan on, you know, two or three years before harvesting is when you got to start hammering away at it to, to make any, any way with it. Right. Uh, we were asked, has anyone tried wet blade mowing for privet control? I do not know. I have not seen anything about that. Yeah, nor have I. Um, if you do cut the stump, how long does the above, down, the above ground material take to break down? And I guess I'm thinking, hmm. if you're cutting those, doing that stump treatment, you cut the top and you lay them in a pile, is that right. going to break down you know, quickly like a pine, or is it going to just sit there for years? <laughs> I don't know if anyone's actually measured it carefully, but I I would think it would be relatively quickly. Okay. But it's a lot of small diameter stuff. I just wasn't right. But it's not going to be, you know, like it's going to be at least I would think half a half a year to a year at least. Right. Right. Uh, do you have any recommendations for a combination of treatments for privet, or or what would you say is the optimal privet treatment method? Like I mentioned, it really depends on the situation, the density of the stand, how large they are, how much time and money you have. Um, mm -hmm. So ideally, I, I think, well, so some people say that a foliar spray is probably the most cost effective. I've read that. Um, you know, if you're doing cut stump or basil bark, those can be fairly effective. And one thing that I neglected to mention with basil bark, I'm remembering now, is that with that, you do have the situation where you're going to have the standing dead. And so if you're in a public right. area where you don't want dead plants that aren't very aesthetically pleasing or they might be hazards, you know, that might not be something to use. But I would sure. say typically, so a mechanical followed by herbicide is probably your best bet for credit. <clears throat> Do you know of any programs available to landowners to help with the cost of treatments? Well, that's going to vary with state, and I don't know what the current situation is. In the past, EQIP would sometimes would have um, money available for privet control. I don't yeah. know if that's currently the yeah, case. I would, I would recommend uh, there's two to three different people you're going to want to talk to. It depends on who you are and where you are and what state. You want to go with your, your local state forestry commission. There's probably a forest health specialist, uh, you know, that's your state lead. In Georgia, it's Chip Bates. In Alabama, it's Dana Stone. They will know what state resources are available to help with, with something like this. And it's probably not going to be called treatment. It's probably going to be something like, uh, you know, reforestation or rehabilitation, that type of thing. And RCS. Yep. And RCS Equip also has a program. Um, Again, each state has an NRCS contact. Those are the two that I would start with to anyone that is looking for some sort of cost share uh, programs to help with the cost of these treatments. And right here, Michael Hall says NRCS has EQIP funds. Uh, EQIP is just one of their grant programs. 
So they have uh, uh, funds for herbaceous weed control. So I forget who asked the question, but I would say probably go to your local NRCS people first and start there. Right, and those are somewhat time sensitive, depending on time of the year, whether or not they're going to be available. Right, right. I think it's usually one of those things where when uh, when the call comes out, it's sort of first come, first serve type of deal. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, always just contact your local forester. This is Lynn Womack from the Georgia Forestry Commission. So, so the right. moral of the story, get with your local forester uh, or your local um, NRCS person. Can privet be used in compost? Hmm. I've not seen anything about that one way or the other. I would think so. The danger would be you would definitely want to make sure you didn't have any seeds in there. Ah, right, 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 yes. Uh, one other comment about controlling privet, also remember conservation uh, districts. Sometimes they have programs as well. Oh. So I think there are a lot of resources out there. We just need to, re you know, you just need to do your due diligence and look around and try to figure out where they are. Um, that seems to be mm, all the questions and all the things. The, the one thing I would just like to reiterate is a lot of this, Invasive plant control is very site specific. It depends on if you're looking at trying to get, you know, a little privet out of your back half acre or if you've got a 200 acre forest stand that's overrun. It's just very different control methods for those different situations. In any case, you've got county extension agents, you've got university extension agents, you've got state foresters and all sorts of resources. Don't be afraid and ashamed to try to try to get those. Uh, with that, I will now pass out the uh, link for your CEU. So everyone give me one moment. Let's thank Dr. Nancy Lowenstein. I thought that was a good webinar and so a lot of information. If anyone has questions, get a hold of me and get a hold of her and we will get your questions answered. So thanks a lot and hold tight just a minute.